Welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program in which each week I have the great privilege of introducing you to a different convert to the Catholic Church and also the task of discussing with them a key issue or theme of their journey home. Our guest for this evening is Mark Shea, who many of you know as an author. He's written two books, both of which approach issues of the journey from the perspective of a convert. The first he published is This Is My Body, An Evangelical Discovers the Real Presence. And the second book, which deals with the theme that we'll be focusing on this evening, the theme of sacred tradition, is By What Authority? An Evangelical Discovers Catholic Tradition. Now Mark, for the largest part of his life, had no religious background uh, until during his early 20s. The Lord brought him in a, a powerful adult conversion experience to accept Jesus Christ as his Savior. And then for about nine years, lived a very active uh, Christian faith until at the end of his 20s, the Lord brought him on his journey home to the Catholic faith, joining his wife, who was a lifelong Catholic. Now today's subject is a bit elusive. You're dealing with this very, very important issue of tradition. It sometimes can be even divisive and hard to exactly define. And we're going to deal with that tonight. And that's why I ask you, if you would, to keep this program in prayer. As you know, when you're dealing with issues of such power in our lives as sacred tradition, the spiritual battle can become very uh, intense. And so I also ask you to remember that you're a very important part of this program. So please either call or email us with your questions about this topic. Mark. Welcome to the program. Glad to be here. It's, it's great to have you on this program, and especially, I've been looking forward to us talking about this subject, because the this, this subject which you write about in the book, By What Authority, is one that was very, very important to, to me as a convert on the journey and to so many others, because of the, really, in reality, all the, the topics that we deal with this in the program from week to week are all, are all encompassed in the issue of tradition. I mean, mm -hmm. tradition is a part of our lives like the air we breathe. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because in this time of year especially, uh -huh. we are living in, a, in, in the time of the year when we're most aware, I think, of tradition and also when tradition, I think, is least threatening. Yeah. Um, we have all kinds of traditions that surround Christmas. Some which, as we'll look at, we would call it capital T traditions. Right. Some very, 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 very little T traditions. Very little T. Some yeah. which our entire culture holds important, some which only our family holds important. Right. Which those outside of our family can't figure out, why do you do this? Well, that's a tradition yeah. in our family. Yeah. But before we jump in with both feet into the, the topic of tradition, share with us uh, a bit of your own spiritual journey. Okay. I was, uh, as you mentioned, I was raised in a, an, a, an American civil religion home, I guess <laughs> is what you would call it. Uh, I didn't have any particular religious belief when I was growing up. I, I used to, I remember boasting in high school, in fact, that I didn't believe in organized religion. What I didn't <laughs> realize at that time was that that meant I believed in disorganized religion. <laughs> uh, and that was really the sort of outlook that I had. I believed in mystery. I believed that there was something supernatural about the world, uh, but I had, that was about it. I yeah. didn't really know anything. My attitude was sort of, um, you know, God, I see other people, God sees other people, and that's fine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and when I was 20 years old and living in the uh, dormitories at the University of Washington, uh, after uh, how should you put it, experiencing the sort of life that college students in the, in the <laughs> late 70s experienced. Um, Great holiness. Uh, yeah, profound holiness. It was very Augustinian. <laughs> um, I early had, Augustinian. Uh, early Augustinian. <laughs> I had, a, I had a, 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 a profound conversion experience uh, in which I discovered, first of all, uh, that all was not well with me. Uh, and that I needed a savior, and that there was one. Um, and the way in which Christ came to me at that time, uh, which I think was no accident, as we know nothing is an accident, yeah. <laughs> um, he came to me in two ways. One was through uh, a, uh, um, a college dorm prayer group mm -hmm. that eventually sort of coalesced into a church, and also uh, uh, through the writings of C.S. Lewis. Yes. Oh, um, such a powerful witness for so many. Oh, so many people, yeah. you know. Um, and 
So I became a believer, and when I, when I became a believer, I looked around and I saw these other Christians that were living on the dorm floor. They were evangelical, non-denominational, um, charismatic Christians. And I said, these are the Christians God has put me with, mm. so I'll stick with them, because this is what I know. Um, and so I remained there, uh, and we for eventually, <coughs> excuse me, formed a church. Formed a church? Yeah. Yeah. Um, th this is, I mean, this sounds odd to Catholics, of course, um, because you don't just go out and start a church because Christ started the church. But one thing that's important, I think, for, for Catholics to recognize when looking at the phenomenon of non-denominational uh, evangelicalism is that in many ways it's really, I think, a not an accurate description to describe what we did as a Protestant yeah. church because we weren't protesting that's anything. Right. We were people who had not known anything about Jesus who were now becoming Christians, and we were doing the best we could. Mm -hmm. And I think Christ honored that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we uh, formed our church, and, and um, that continued uh, for about another 10 years. Um, it eventually disbanded a couple of years after I left the, that church to become Catholic. Not because I left, yeah. uh, but it just that's the way things fell out. Um, and somewhere in the midst of that, you got married? And <coughs> somewhere in the midst of that, I got married. I got married in uh, 1983 to my mm -hmm. wife, Jan, mm -hmm. uh, who's cradle Catholic, and uh, continued sort of merrily uh, in that way. And probably mm -hmm. thinking that you'd arrived and this would, this would be the journey for the rest of your life in some sense? Well, actually, uh, in a certain sense, no. Because um, what I began to discover more and more was um, lack, <laughs> yeah, yeah. growing lack, not just theological lack, uh, but also there was there was a deep hunger in me that I couldn't put my yeah. finger on. Yeah. And it, uh, I, what I kept telling myself was, you know, well, hey, you know, you, you've got, you know, you you you've been born again, you believe in Jesus, so what else do you need, right? Nonetheless, uh, I still had this growing sense that all was not well. You know, it. it and when we say this, we don't want to in any way be, uh, uh, you know, uh, Protestant bashers. Because oh, no, we, no. The last thing we want to do that is because we're so thankful. Not for at all. Yeah. In fact, one of the things that I, I continually stress is that, um, I mean, I learned all the basics of the faith as an evangelical. Like I say, it was not an accident that I was put, to God could have if he'd wanted to. He could have, you know, just brought me directly into the Catholic Church. He chose not to do That's that. And I think there's reasons for that. Hmm. I learned to pray um, from evangelicals who taught me to pray. I learned my Bible hmm. uh, from evangelicals who taught me my Bible. Hmm. Uh, I learned so many things. Um, I learned uh, the, the importance of, of uh, uh, in, in a yeah. funny way, I learned the importance of the teaching authority of the church. Well, I was there. thinking that you were talking about this, yeah. this lack, mm -hmm. and this gets us into that the topic of tradition because one of the problems with the non-denominational phenomenon is this mm -hmm. idea that there's a recognition that the reason that we are quote non-denominational is because we differ a little bit from this little group or this little group mm -hmm. or this little group or this little group mm -hmm. and so we look at the issues that divide, divided us mm -hmm. and then presume that these particular issues must not be that important right. and so as a result it, we limit what the gospel is to a very small essential nature which mm -hmm. is really deciding that these are really the on, only traditions that we consider important mm -hmm. and these other really small T traditions mm -hmm. are not important. And my mm -hmm. question is, during that time, where was tradition as a part of your this evangelical <coughs> experiment that you were with with the starting of this old church? Well, it's interesting. I mean, there was, <coughs> there was, there's always been, I've always had an appreciation of tradition in a certain sense, not in, in terms of sacred tradition as the church means it, but uh, again, you know, Christmas time. Um, you know, I love Christmas, for example. The idea of s just simple human traditions, I think, is just part and par parcel of being human. Yeah, yeah. You have to cut something out of yourself to um, what you know, deny left? that you like a, a Christmas yeah. tree, or you know, yeah. we won't have candles on our birthday cakes because that's a tradition. If we tried to yeah. really cut tradition out of our lives, if we, if we try to get lives, tradition out of our lives, there's there's nothing left it'd after be very a while. Are we very disjointed? And life. so I recognized <coughs> the value of tradition on a human scale. Um, what I didn't understand 
was what the church was talking about when it was talking about yeah. tradition. And you had traditions, though, sure. even though you probably didn't call them traditions. Sure. But certainly, there sure. were things that you felt were uh, un, uh, were not things you could deny. As sure. Faithful. Well, I was curious. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the things that we didn't do, for example, was we did, of course, as most most evangelical churches don't. We didn't, for example, celebrate feast days or mm -hmm. keep a liturgical calendar. Yeah. But, of course, along with the rest of the world, we celebrated Christmas and Easter. Yeah. And this is, just, this is tradition, of course. Um, and that was fine, you know, and I didn't see anything wrong with that at all. Well, during that time, what do you think, if anything, about the Catholic position on tradition? I thought, basically, that the Catholic position was what you got after you dunked the gospel in the briny ocean of humanity for 2,000 years, you <laughs> pulled it back out and it was encrusted with barnacles and that's what sacred tradition yeah. is, as far as I was concerned yeah, at that from time. that perspective. Yeah. Which necessarily wasn't an informed perspective. Uh, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever opened your heart then to, you know, get you thinking about the Catholic Church? Well, several things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, um, C.S. Lewis says that, you know, a good atheist can never be too careful of his reading. <laughs> and in a similar way, um, as, as an evangelical, I, 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 if I'd wanted to avoid the Catholic Church, I should have been more cautious about my reading. Hmm. Um, because I began to look at uh, um, what Catholics actually mean when they're talking about sacred tradition. I began to wonder about a number of things. Uh, we read, for example, books on great revivals in the church. And the, and the book took it back to the Reformation, and then there was this huge <laughs> gap, and then there was like St. Paul yeah. over here doing this, and I just started wondering, there must have been something going on in the church for 15 <laughs> centuries, you know, surely it can't have been all that bad. And part of the reason I got curious about that was because um, my interest in evangelization and apologetics, I run into many non-Christians who spoke as though all of Christian history was just this sort of meaningless blank where yeah. you know, uh, you know, all Christians were fools, and I knew that they weren't right. S so was it really wise of me to be speaking as though all Catholics were fools, especially since some of those Catholics were people like Saint Thomas, yeah. you know, and Saint Augustine? And I thought they don't seem terribly dumb to me. Perhaps I'm missing something. And when I began to look at the way in which the Church actually regards tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I was particularly struck by Chesterton's comment that tradition is the democracy of the dead. Mm -hmm. uh, that it was, in fact, a way of giving voice to other Christians who had had a valid experience of Christ just as I had, mm -hmm. and the only reason we didn't listen to them was because they happened to be dead. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, maybe it's worth listening to the voices of my great-great-grandfathers mm -hmm. and hearing what they learned. Um, Mark Twain mentions that when he was Fifteen, he thought his father was the stupidest man alive, and he was amazed at how much the old man learned in <laughs> ten years. You know? <laughs> and I had the same sort of experience. I started thinking, perhaps people who lived before me know a thing or two, yeah. and I've missed oh, out. That's on. interesting because we did write off all those fifteen centuries as if it was the time when all these myths and traditions, which we always put in quotes because we didn't mm -hmm. believe that you could trust tradition right. at all, right. kind of arose out of pagan sources and mm -hmm. totally ignorance of those years. Mm -hmm. uh, or also I would say that in my own Congregationalist period before I became Presbyterian, um, we held as the heroes of history the Donatists the Waldensians, <laughs> you know, all the people that the Catholic Church uh, had kicked out, uh -huh. you know, they were the ones uh -huh. that we held as the great heroes, uh -huh. the holders of the faith throughout those the 1500 Thomas. years. Yeah. You know, and uh, again, that comes from not taking the time to read history. But as you said, yeah. sometimes when you read history, you get in trouble. Yeah. And one of the things I began to do, my <coughs> book talks about this some, um, one of the things I began to do was take a good look at the fathers of the church. Mm. Yeah, and gee, they don't look very evangelical. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, and these are people, some of them, um, you know, some of the very early fathers of the church are people who heard the apostles with their own ears. And they had the distinct impression that the Eucharist was the body and blood of Christ, for example. Yeah. And they spoke of apostolic succession and uh, they had a sacramental worldview. Uh, so all of this is percolating in. And then I read a, a very important book, which. Um, you all should read out there, <laughs> uh, if you, especially if you're evangelical. Uh, read Evangelical is Not Enough oh, by, Tom, by Howard. Tom Howard, which is a magnificent book. 
Yes. And um, <laughs> this really opened up the whole sacramental liturgical way to me. It made me realize a couple of things, speaking of tradition. We thought, as, as uh, charismatics, that we were not a liturgical church. <laughs> What, we dis what I discovered was that we were a liturgical church, um, the way our liturgy went, and it was almost unfailing every week once I began to notice it, was we opened by singing three kind of upbeat songs, and then we sang three slower songs, and then we s sang three worshipful songs, and then it was time for it's the a sermon. A very strict schedule. Yeah. And, and, and then there was a time for you know prayer and praise, mm -hmm. And uh, then there is usually an altar call where people would come up and you know ask for prayer and so forth, almost without fail. This was the liturgy, yeah. and there were rubrics. Sure, because there were things that which you could do sure. in those time periods and things you weren't yeah. supposed to do in that. And these yeah. are the traditions sure. that are, are are rampant amongst all Christian sure. faiths mm -hmm. that often w uh, we're blind to. Yeah, that, and that guide well, the faith. And my point is, well, they should be. Yeah. Because it really is the case that if you don't believe in organized religion, the only option is you believe in disorganized religion. <laughs> and human beings require order. God is not a God of disorder. And so we tend to gravitate toward recreating, and I've noticed this many, many times, we tended to gravitate toward recreating something that at least approximated yeah. what is done in Catholic circles. So, um, I, you know, we thought we didn't believe in sacred tradition, for example. Yeah. Um, I thought we didn't believe in sacred tradition, but as I began to look at the way we lived as evangelicals, the fact was, of course we believed in sacred tradition. The difference was not that Catholics believe in sacred tradition and we evangelicals didn't. The real difference was that Catholics believed in sacred tradition and knew they did, and we evangelicals <laughs> believed in sacred tradition and didn't know we, <laughs> didn't did. know we did. And so, you know, for example, I mean, you know, uh, this is what my book talks about, how do we know what books belonged in the Bible. Yeah. There's no, the table of contents is not inspired. So yes. how do we know? <laughs> we know because we've accepted this piece of sacred tradition that percolated down to us through mm -hmm. the Reformation. And there are a number of other instances we can talk about. Well, the Lord opens your heart to this and, and mm -hmm. brings you home mm -hmm. to the Catholic Church along, you know, your wife was a cradle Catholic. Right. And maybe later we can talk about her witness to you. Yeah. But maybe at this point, let's bring in the issue of, okay, what does the Catholic Church mean by Tradition. Okay, fair enough. Uh, the catechism is pretty straightforward. I like this, actually. Um, um, it means, sacred tradition means the common life, common worship, and common teaching of the church. Okay. Um, that means not only what is written in scripture, uh, but also the whole life and worship of the church, the way in which the church reads scripture, for example, uh, the way in which it understands the revelation, the way in which it lives out the revelation, the, in, in a certain sense, the very structure of the church okay. is, the tra is tradition. Um, all of these things are the way in which the Spirit of Christ works mm -hmm. through his people. Okay. So we call it a living tradition. Right. Um, does that mean it's always changing? Always evolving? Um, not evolving, but growing, yes. Yeah. Um, Jesus very aptly describes uh, the kingdom of God as a mustard seed. The one thing a mustard seed doesn't do is stay the same. Mm -hmm. um, mustard, but on the other hand, when you plant a mustard seed, you don't get a rhinoceros <laughs> or something else. You get something that's even more mustardy yeah. than it was originally. And this is, this is, what, this is one of the things that convinced uh, John Henry Newman. Yes. who wrote the great essay on the development of Christian doctrine, was that um, he said, you know, what would the early church look like if you planted it and let it grow for 18 centuries? And he concluded why it would look like the Catholic Church. Yeah, to his surprise. Yeah, and, um, and, and to mine. That's well, what is the connection then between what we call tradition and, let's say, the apostolic deposit of faith? Well, the apostolic deposit of faith is, I mean, this is the revelation that's given to there's us. There's the acorn. Yeah, there's the acorn. Um, the acorn is planted in the soil of the earth and it begins to grow. And it begins to do unexpected things almost mm. immediately. Mm. So, for example, I mean, um, as, a, as an evangelical, for example, I would have said, you know, the assumption of Mary, <laughs> where is that, yeah. you know, in scripture? Show me this in scripture. Well, 
it's not explicit in scripture. But scripture read in light of the tradition, hmm. it's there. Okay, I, I didn't understand that at the time, but one of the things that I began to realize when I looked at scripture itself was, if you look, for example, in the book of Acts, at the great circumcision controversy, there was a controversy in the early church, should Gentiles be circumcised in order to become Christians? Well, if you were just going on the basis of scripture alone at that time, well, let's see, God commands Abraham to you know, be circumcised, to circumcise all of his offspring as an everlasting covenant, right? <laughs> all, Moses is circumcised, all the prophets are circumcised, Jesus is circumcised, the apostles are all circumcised, everybody at the Council of Jerusalem was a circumcised Jew. Yeah. Um, could anything be clearer from scripture than that circumcision is required by God forever and ever and ever, world without end, amen. <laughs> and yet, the council says, no, we don't need to do this anymore. Because they read the scripture in light of the apostolic tradition. And the church has continued to do that uh, to this day. And so we always speak of scripture, it's almost a mistake, I think, in a, in a certain sense, to speak of scripture and tradition because scripture is part of the tradition. It's, it's to speak of scripture and tradition is like talking about my, my chest and my torso. Yeah. Um, In fact, why don't I read, you, read a portion of scripture that deals with the issue of tradition and maybe if you could make a comment on this uh, uh, and the importance of this text, which is one we've read before on the show. It comes from 2 Thessalonians uh, verse 15. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions mm -hmm. which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. Right, and that's that's the apostolic. That's the way the apostles handed on the tradition in a nutshell, either by word of mouth, that is by what we call tradition. Um, and I should put a little caveat in here. When we say word of mouth, we're not simply meaning oral tradition. Sometimes the tradition is handed down by gesture, for example. Oh yes. Um, if, as my one of my priests pointed out, uh, if Saint Peter to wa were to walk into a church today, he would recognize nothing but he would recognize that gesture. Hmm. Um, he wouldn't know the language. Or he may recognize... He might recognize the sign, sign of, the of the cross. cross which we see very early right. in references. And that's important that the early church fathers, mm -hmm. reading them, we see mm -hmm. these references of this stand firm and hold to. Mm -hmm. That's the job of the church. Mm -hmm. Really, mm -hmm. that's what the, the purpose of the church, to protect, to preserve, and to promote, to proclaim. Right. The traditions handed from Jesus to the apostles yeah. all the way through. And in a part of that process, some of them were written down, and they had to decide which ones were to be declared in the canon and which ones, wait, these aren't of the capital T tradition. Right. Some of these, like the Didache, are little t tradition. Mm -hmm. and maybe we didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. This distinction between capital T tradition and little t tradition. I've heard that since coming right. into the church. Right. The, uh, well, the, the first thing to remember is that, um, because people often have this attitude, which I call minimum daily adult <laughs> Christianity, which is, you know, what exactly is, you know, the bare minimum that I can get away with believing and still be a Catholic, you know, which I always, my response to that is always, you know, what exactly is the bare minimum you can get away with uh, you know, for your wife and still be a good husband, <laughs> you know, is that really, the, is that's that the language love. of love? That's, that's, not, the that's not the language of love. And I've heard it often expressed right. differently, but it is. Right. We don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so it's, you know, it's what I want to talk about is to say, you know, on the one hand, the fact is the defined dogmatic teaching of the church, which is really when we're talking about capital T tradition, that's the area we're talking about. The defined dogmatic teaching of the church is really, really small. There's very hmm. little, hmm. really. I mean, when you think about the fact that the church has been around for 2,000 years, there's very little dogma that the church has defined. Just war or pacifism? Well, take your pick. <laughs> you know, you can hold both positions, be a perfectly good Catholic. Yeah. Um, all kinds of different issues. You know, should you be a Republican or a Democrat or a Christian socialist or blah, blah, blah. The church isn't going to define dogmas about stuff like that. The church has left a lot of things open. Well, what's the relationship then from well, Catholic to a capital T tradition? Well, the capital T tradition demands assent. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, one of the things that the, that the catechism does very nicely is it breaks 
down the faith into four basic areas. So, the Ten Commandments. What must we do? This is what the Ten Commandments addresses. Um, the Creed. What must we believe? This is what we believe. This creed summarizes our faith. Um, by the way, the creed does not claim to be the comprehensive, all-encompassing definition of God, of course, because no human mind can yeah. define God in that sense. But it is the thing that <coughs> below which we cannot go. We can't say, well, I'm not sure if there's just one God. You know? <laughs> uh, if we do that, then we're no longer Catholic, you know, and so forth. Um, the Lord's Prayer. How, must, how do we pray? And the seven sacraments. How do we worship? These things are what the church calls the symbols of the faith. That's an interesting expression, the symbols of the faith. They are not the faith itself, because the faith itself is Jesus Christ. These things are symbols of the faith, and they are accurate. They, are, they convey revelation to us. But the revelation that is conveyed is a person, Jesus. Okay. What about how do little t traditions? What are they, and how do they fit oh, into this? Millions of them. There's zillions and zillions of them. <laughs> um, all kinds of things. Um, and the church essentially says, the more the merrier. As yeah. long as they're coherent with the faith, go for it. You yeah. know, enjoy yourself. So, for um, Advent candles, you know, yeah. uh, all kinds of things. I mean, the Stations of the Cross. Um, um, Touching the, fa the feet of Jesus as you walk by a crucifix. Sure. You know, things millions of, of, yeah, millions and what millions. What is the of danger things. of getting the big T's and the little T's mixed up? Oh, well, the danger is what Scripture warns of. Um, these things, which are not of the essence of the faith, if we try to make them of the essence of the faith, then uh, we, we create great mischief. So, for example, um, uh, you know, if you don't uh, do X, uh, yeah. for my, you know, uh, this by the way is, is both a Protestant and a Catholic phenomenon, yeah. I should mention. Uh, what's a good example of a, of a Catholic little tea tradition that can get, you know, elevated? If you don't uh, um, cross yourself with holy water as you're leaving the church, um, you're just not really a Christian. And if you got all the way home and you forgot to do it, you should get in your car yeah. and go all the way back. I had a friend, <laughs> I, <laughs> I had a friend who, when he was a little kid, he somehow got himself into this mindset where he believed that if you didn't cross yourself in the name of the Trinity before you started praying, somehow your prayer just wouldn't stick. It was sort yeah. of like, you know, begin transmission. Yeah. And, and this was, and God couldn't hear your prayer otherwise. This is an example, kids can often uh, get into this thing. And there's a danger on both sides. There's a danger on the one hand of getting the big T's and the little T's of tradition mixed up so right. that we elevate things that are not as essential to essentials. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that so often divide. Sure. That's one hand. Sure. But on the other hand, we don't want to get careful belittle, belittling the power of little T traditions. Oh, you know, absolutely in yeah. those. And that's why the church says yeah. that there are many, many ways that the Spirit leads us in our right. devotion, yeah. in our in the developing of discipline, to me that's what tradition right. means. Yeah. You know, you, you get up in the morning and you have your half an hour devotion. Yeah. For you that becomes a tradition that helps you right. have a daily walk with Christ. Right. We have a habit in our family of blessing our children at bedtime. Uh, does the church demand we do this? No, of course not. But our children now need it because we've done this, this is a tradition. And family. what's exciting, that will become a regular tradition in their built into their faith. Sure. There's so much we can cover in tradition, but we'll have to come back in a minute. Okay. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment for your phone calls and email, email messages on this very important topic of tradition. Thank you. Welcome back to The Journey Home. We're meeting with Mark Shea, and our topic for this program is sacred tradition. And as so often, there's so much we would like to cover in this particular topic, but we just kind of scratched the surface. But now we'd like to take your calls and email messages. Why don't we begin with a call, if we would. Hello, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Tina, and I'm calling from California. Hello, Tina. Hi. What's your question for us, Tina? Uh, my question is, I have a Protestant friend and we have shared 
the face um, extensively, and he just cannot seem to get over the um, the theology of sola scriptura. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that I have left him with is I suggested that he get in contact with writings of the early church fathers, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know if he's done that yet, but I'm wondering if there's anything else that I can do to help him to evangelize him. Um, I prayed for him. I think he's a wonderful person and he just really loves the Lord and is very knowledgeable in sacred scripture mm -hmm. and I think he'd be a wonderful Catholic. Uh -huh. right. And so I, if you can help me. Thank you very much for your question. Mark. Oh well, several things. Um, the, the, the big sticking point with Sola Scriptura is sacred tradition, the authority yeah. of sacred tradition. That's always the issue. That's what it boils down to is, uh, uh, is, is Scripture alone the source of revelation, the, the final rule of faith, or, or is it not? Um, and how do, we, how do we understand that kind of terminology? Um, one recommendation that I could make would be to get a hold of um, Scott Hans. Yeah. Got a wonderful tape series that he did in which, like a good Thomist would do, he makes the strongest arguments for sola scriptura that he could make. Very, very strong arguments. Um, and then proceeds to take them apart and um, uh, show that, that um, we can't even know what books are supposed to be in our Bible without sacred tradition. Uh, it simply cannot be done. Uh, the way we know what books belong in our Bible is because uh, the church discerned that. Uh, we do not sit down with, you know, First Clement and um, the Epistle of Barnabas and the Didache and so forth and read them along with our New Testament books and say, well, I like this book, and I don't like the book of Revelation, so I'm just going to say that this book is scripture and that one isn't. That's not how it works. You walk into a church, whether you're Protestant or Catholic, somebody hands you a Bible and says, here, this is the Word of God. If you say, Amen, you have just given assent to sacred tradition, whether you realize it or not. Um, and this is but one example, and, S and Scott does a wonderful job of, uh, of uh, um, showing the the way in which scripture and tradition uh, are wedded. Um, they're not competitors. And this is, I think, um, something that's very, very important to understand. I, another part of her question, I think, gives us a chance to talk about something else, too, in mm -hmm. the area of tradition. And that is, as she mentioned, about evangelizing her friend mm -hmm. who loves Jesus Christ. Right. You know, is a brother in Christ with us. And mm -hmm. I don't want to give the impression to, to our non-Catholic listeners that, that we somehow get the impression that they're been, not Christian or something. That they're not Christian right. or that has right. been misunderstood that the church teaches that, that unless you have your name on the roll somewhere in a Catholic church, right. you're in danger of yeah, damnation. Right. Yeah. We don't believe that. But what, what we encourage you to do is with great chari charity and prayer, share the joys of the Catholic faith with your friend. Yeah. And especially challenge them in this issue because sola scriptura, as good as it may sound on the surface, has led to great, great division mm -hmm. in Christianity. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I agree. <laughs> uh, the 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 real one of the real keys here, I think, is to really bear in mind um, that your friend is a Christian, which of course I think you you know. Um, it's it is the case that um, scripture, and we're seeing this process. I talk about this in my book, by what authority? Scripture separated from tradition, not only is subject to multiple interpretations, uh, but it's also subject to dissolution. Uh, we're seeing this, for example, uh, from conclaves like the Jesus Seminar. They get together and yeah. vote on what Jesus did or mostly didn't what say. What did he really say or didn't say? <laughs> what did he yeah, really yeah. say? Um, when we take scripture out of the context of the community that created it, um, it's a little bit like ripping a photo album out of somebody's hands, out of a family, and just saying, well, these pictures don't mean anything to me. Well, no, they yeah. wouldn't. The only reason these pictures make sense is because they're part of the life of this family. And if you want to understand these pictures, you have to understand the family that 
that took the pictures and, and yeah, put them the in the album. traditions that surround And that's what scripture is. Scripture is, so to speak, the family album of the church. And if you take it away from the church, then you can get anything or nothing from it. All right, wonderful. Let's, let's go to an email. I came into the Catholic Church three years ago from an evangelical experience, having accepted Jesus as my Savior while in college. Mm -hmm. Where does this kind of experience fit into the Catholic faith I now embrace? This it's experience. a valid experience. Um, uh, conversion experience. I, I did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I did exactly the same thing. Uh, you had a real experience. You became a believer in Christ. Um, the church teaches that um, um, uh, baptism, you know, a, a valid baptism is a valid baptism when, when you came to believe in, in Christ. Uh, in my own case, I'm, I'm about as far out on the end of the spectrum as you can get. When I became a believer, I wasn't even baptized. Because <laughs> the church, the people that I knew didn't practice sacraments. And does that mean I wasn't a Christian? No, because the church, what I experienced was called a baptism of desire. Yeah. I didn't know about sacramental baptism. And when I did find out about sacramental baptism, and I started thinking about it and praying about it, the Holy Spirit impressed on my heart that you need to be baptized. And so I was baptized. All of these things are, they're like, how should you put it? It's like the growth of a fetus almost. Yeah. Um, you begin with a conception, and there's growth and change after that. And very often, as in my case, and, and also in yours, um, that growth came in stages. And that's fine. That's all right. Um, of course, the point is, is that when God leads you toward the Catholic Church, and you become convicted in your conscience that it's the truth, you can't hang back and say, well, I like living in the womb. You know? <laughs> Well, the danger of, of the experience, there's right. great blessing in the experience, but the danger can be if that experience occurs outside of the, the faithful teaching right. and, and tradition of the church, because right. how do we interpret what that, that right. experience means uh, when we have our adult uh, rebirth of our faith? For those mm -hmm. that myself went through many years, a good upbringing in the Lutheran faith, but then mm -hmm. went through college where I just abandoned everything, and then an adult experience, I remember thinking, that all, I have to start all over from scratch. I need to be right. rebaptized and all of that. Right. The nine yards. Right. It, it took me quite a while to mature, to appreciate the yeah. seed that was planted way right. back. Yeah, yeah, and the fact that you know we, we mess up sometimes. I mean, to say, well, we mess up, you know, and therefore everything that happened is invalid. It's like saying, well, I got a D in geometry in high school, so I have to retake elementary school. <laughs> well, no, you don't. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in the same way, I mean, we um, we have these these encounters of grace, and we grow from them, you know, but that's to lead us to the next encounter of yeah. grace. Yeah. Let's go do another phone call. Uh, hello, uh, what's your name and, and what's your question for tonight? Yes, uh, good evening, Marcus. Good evening. My name is Nick, and I'm from Baltimore. Hello, Nick. Um, I'd like to thank you for the privilege to speak with you, and uh, my question is, knowing you were a Protestant minister and converted to Catholicism, could you explain your view now of what the Protestants call the rapture? And do you feel we're in tribulations now? Thank and I'd like to uh, thank the Journey Home. I feel, truly feel that uh, EWTN and the Journey Home are truly a blessing from the Holy Spirit. And God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, this tradition. I mean, we're talking about the tradition of the rapture, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it doesn't have a very long history, does it? It's about a hundred years old. That's right. Came out of a, the the, uh, the collection of a certain passages of scripture that were interpreted in a certain way, and uh, Darby out of England and started a group in this whole idea of the rapture. Mm -hmm. um, I think this this issue of the end times and tribulation mm -hmm. um, are quite a bit different than so many Protestant ways of looking at it. I think mm -hmm. that's what the question. The, the question I was getting at. The problem is you can't nail down, on the one hand, any one Protestant way of looking at the end times. Right. I mean, there's, there's a plethora mm -hmm. of ways of looking at it. And then within the Catholic faith, we have a wide span yeah. of how we look at the end times. Right. This is a classic example of Catholic liberty. Um, the only dogmatic stuff we have as Catholics is, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will be without end. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. The rest is, you know, hey, you know, if you've got a theory about the end times, you know, that doesn't contradict church teaching, enjoy yourself. Yeah. Knock yourself out. Yeah. Um, but as long as you don't sit in judgment on another Catholic who doesn't share your theory. 
Um, and that's, that's about as far as it goes with Catholics. Um, Protestants, uh, you can probably speak to this better than I can, because again, I went in a certain sense, the, as an evangelical, the church that I went to was, was atypical in two ways. One was we did not have sacraments. The other was we put almost no ef emphasis on, on end, time. Uh, end time stuff. Well, I wasn't one to be into the rapture. That's actually a very small segment of Protestantism that mm -hmm. holds to that. And, but every year I would give a sermon entitled, I can guarantee you that Christ will come again in your lifetime. I gave it every year. Uh -huh. And I would preach it. Either, either he'll come in the clouds or he'll come at the moment and yeah, when we die. <laughs> you know, yeah. and that's in fact going to happen. And, yeah. you know, Jesus, in, in his own teaching, talks, teaches us how to deal with these difficult times that we look at as many of us anticipate that, well, is, is mm -hmm. the year 2000 going to be uh, some great tribulation? And he, Jesus gives a wonderful way of looking at it. On the one hand, he does not want us to be complacent, mm -hmm. but he also doesn't want us to go over looking around every corner as if, is this the next Jesus or has Jesus come again? Mm -hmm. We're called to wait and to watch and to be prepared and ready. Mm -hmm. It might come tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we want to get into the whole, we don't have time to get into the whole tribula tribulation sure. issues, the Marian prophecies and things. Mm -hmm. But I think that within the teaching of the church, there are certain aspects, especially of Fatima, Mm -hmm. that lead us on the one hand to see things that seem to be happening right now and very soon, but within the teaching of the church, they aren't required capital T traditions right. for us. But right. on the other hand, Jesus says, be prepared at any right. moment to meet your maker. Yeah. Why don't we go to another call, if we would. Uh, hello, what's your name and what's your call for us? Uh, hi, my name is Anthony. Hello. Yep. Uh, I have an evangelical friend who has a trouble with tradition because they have a, a trouble with traditions of men and mm -hmm. the traditions of God, mm -hmm. that there's a difference. Mm -hmm. And about that girl who was talking about an evangelical Protestant friend who should read a book, I got an excellent book, Carl Keaton's Catholicism and Fundamentalism oh, yeah. by Carl Keaton. That's an excellent book for all Catholics and even uh, non-Catholics to read so they can understand our faith so they won't, they'll know what the truth is instead of believing in what other people tell them. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly right. Yeah, uh, well, it, okay. First of all, it's perfectly true the scripture does warn against the traditions of men. Um, what the scripture does not warn against is traditions of God. And in fact, as we've already seen, St. Paul tells us um, that what he handed down, whether it's by word of mouth, that is by tradition, or by letter, that is by scripture, we're to hold to. Later on in that letter, he actually warns the Thessalonians uh, <laughs> to keep away from people who ignore the traditions. And so the question is not, is something traditional? Uh, the question is, is something apostolic? Nowhere in scripture is it assumed that apostolic equals written. Um, this actually is a tradition of men. Um, it is not a, a given that that which is apostolic is only written down. Um, that which is apostolic is handed down in many different ways. Supremely uh, in the Eucharist, for example. Um, this is the very embodiment of apostolic tradition being handed down to us. Um, Maybe another thing to throw in here is this beware of, of traditions of men. Right. can be taken much too far. It can be taken much too far. I, you know, I've met people who refuse, for example, to celebrate birthdays. Oh, you're making a special day, sacred, you know, and so forth. I, you know, you can meet people who won't celebrate Christmas because it's not mentioned in the Bible. Well, the birth of Jesus is mentioned in the Bible, okay, but Christmas <laughs> isn't. Um, the, the only problem with human traditions is when, well, two problems. One is when a human tradition uh, contradicts the, the revelation of God. So, for example, human sacrifice is a tradition in our <laughs> culture, you know. Well, sorry, it contradicts the revelation of God. But also, we, the only other time that human tradition is trouble, and this is what Jesus is excoriating the Pharisees about, is when human tradition is, switches places uh, with sacred tradition. Mm -hmm. Then you've got trouble. But human tradition, just as human tradition, we can't live without it. Yeah. Um, you know, why do we have summer vacation? 
uh, it's you know after school. Well, no reason. It's just a tradition. Why do we have Advent candles? Are these things harmful? No, they're not harmful. I NFL on Sunday afternoon might be a good tradition. That's a fine tradition. <laughs> Some of them might be a bad uh, tradition. You know, well, but yeah. if you raise it to sacred tradition, when you raise it to sacred <laughs> tradition and say, if you're not watching the NFL after <laughs> mass on Sunday, then you're not really a Christian. That's where you got trouble. <laughs> and this is what the Pharisees were doing. What? You don't wash your hands before you eat? You're obviously apostate. This is the kind of thing that Jesus is, is getting upset about. But he's not saying that the tradition of God is a bad thing. So. Excellent. Let's, let's go to another caller, if we would. Hello. What's your name and what's your question for us tonight? Oh, hello. This is Michael. Uh, my question is, is it scripturally sound to tithe in the New Testament? Uh, I was uh, raised a Church of Christ and married a Pentecostal girl. And the Church of Christ uh, claimed that tithing was done away with, according to Hebrews chapter 7, and, of course, the Pentecostals stress tithing. It's kind of confusing to me. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I would say that what's... Uh, you're, I would say that you're free to tithe. Uh, you're not bound by law. Uh, you're not under law to tithe. But you must um, um, act out of love. And one of the things that love does, of course, is that it, it, it gives. Um, so that's, that's the way I look at it. It's, speaking of it being done away with, as though you're forbidden to tithe, uh, I don't think that makes any and sense. Yeah, and there's that, again, I mentioned earlier that uh, we get this idea, well, I don't have to do this anymore. Right. You know, uh, we don't have to tithe, so therefore I don't have to tithe. But really, the reason that you tithe was not because you had to in the first place, because mm -hmm. you wanted to. The first fruits mm -hmm. is a way of recognizing that every single cent that we have is God's. Mm -hmm. Every single cent. Yeah. And so the idea of tithing is that the first 10 percent, out of great gratitude, mm -hmm. eternal gratefulness to God, you return to God and recognize that He really didn't give us 100 percent to live on. Mm -hmm. He gave us 90 percent to live mm -hmm. on, because the first 10 percent. Yeah, and strictly speaking, I mean, if you read the New Testament, one of the things that you find, of course, is Paul going around taking up collections because, right. you know, the, the church in Jerusalem is dirt poor. So he goes and you read in, um, in the letters to the Corinthians, he's saying, you know, I'm coming, you know, get out your shekels and I'm going to take a collection and we're going to take it back and give it to the church in Jerusalem. Was that a tithe? No, it was, it was an act of love. So. Oh, there's so much that we can we go on to this beautiful topic of tradition and I think we could probably take question upon question of people that wonder, is this a tradition? And, mm -hmm. and that can be very confusing for mm -hmm. folk, especially when we live in a culture that has so many different views of what is true. Mm -hmm. Mark, let me ask you this as we close. Um, in your spiritual journey, what has for you becoming a Catholic and particularly appreciating the Catholic view of sacred tradition, how has it helped you in your own walk with Jesus Christ? Um, I think the thing that has helped me the most, the thing that has prospered in my soul the most has been the recognition of the the great gift of fittingly enough as we approach Christmas of the incarnation mm -hmm. um, Saint Irenaeus said way back in the second century that the glory of God is a man fully alive that's what the Catholic tradition is all about mm -hmm. we Four come nine. close to God not by getting becoming spiritual and sort of putting our humanity aside, you know. There's, there's very much in our culture, there's this idea that spirituality means somehow getting rid of your humanity. Um, our Catholic faith says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that the closer you draw to the heart of what is authentically human, the closer you draw to Jesus Christ, who is the perfect human and who is God. Mm. And this is marvelous to me. Um, it was one of the reasons that I have a devotion to Our Lady because um, um, she is the image of what w we're all called to be, that God is glorified not by saying, I and I alone get all the glory and you guys are all just you know, <laughs> bugs, get out of the way, but rather God is glorified by um, glorifying his servants and glorifying his children. Just as I, you know, if my son does well in school, I think that's great. I write a book. If somebody likes the book, I'm not insulted. You know, yeah. you're taking glory away from me by by praising the book. And in the same way, God says that we are His. Paul, Saint Paul tells us that we are His letters, and this is what God has done. He has He has honored us, and it's I I'm so grateful. 
Well, Mark, I'm grateful for you being a guest on the show, and oh. thank you so much. And thank My you for pleasure. your books, oh. which have appreciated, helped me and others appreciate this great gift of the tradition that we have in this beautiful church. Thank, thank you, Mark. And I'll thank you. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment for some final words for the journey home. Welcome back to The Journey Home. We've been discussing a very important topic tonight, the topic of sacred tradition and how absolutely important it is to our walk in following Christ. As I thought about traditions that are a part of our life, I recognized that sometimes we take these very vital parts of our piety for granted. And traditions that are, like I said earlier in the program, a part of our life like the air we breathe are things that we do and take for granted. Uh, one such tradition, just to mention as we close tonight, is this beautiful tradition of the sign of the cross. When I was a, a non-Catholic for the first half of my life, actually the first 40 years of my life, that was not a tradition. That was all a part of my devotion, my walk with Christ. In coming into the Catholic Church, at first that seemed very awkward and artificial almost as if it was a rite of passage for me to become a Catholic. We all did this. And it's very possible that many people do that because it's just something we do. But I also came to believe and to recognize that behind that great sign of our faith is the confession. When we do the sign of the cross, we are proclaiming who we are in Christ. We're proclaiming our faith. The simple tradition of this wonderful, simple act proclaims not only to everyone around us, but it proclaims to our Lord and Savior to whom we've given our life, but also it is a receiving very powerfully of the blessings of God. Traditions are very important. Capital T traditions, little t traditions, are things that Christ has given us so that together we can share our faith one with another. How do we know what tradition it is we are called to follow? I need to encourage you to make sure these are a part of your life. The Word of God and the Catechism that helps us know the traditions that the Church has protected, preserved, and proclaimed so that we can follow faithfully in our walk with Christ. Thank you so much again for being with us in this program. It is a joy to be with you every week. I look forward to being with you again. And until we meet, I ask that for your prayers that together we can encourage each other on the journey home. Thank you.